What is going on guys? My name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Throughout the history of the Pokemon franchise, distribution events for Pokemon games have been a major part in obtaining some of the rarest Pokemon. While majority of the more recent ones have been not as exciting, the older generations were a different story. During the Game Boy Advance era, mythical Pokemon distributions were treated as a can't miss event. Because Wi-Fi events weren't possible until Generation 4, any time a rare Pokemon became available, you were required to get it in person, and unless you lived in places like New York or Japan, you were pretty much out of luck. Out of the four mythical events that are available in Pokemon Emerald, only two of them are still obtainable, and I managed to get my hands on the rarest one and shiny hunt one of the last remaining legitimate cartridge events for this game. And this is how it went. About seven years ago, right around the time I started making content, I came across a copy of Japanese Pokemon Emerald. At this time, I was working at a warehouse with one of my friends named Tyler, who was also a big fan of the Pokemon games. At an anime convention in Maine, he found this copy of the game and bought it for just $20, which even for 2017 is a pretty insane steal, and after talking about it at work, being the person that I am, I mentioned that there could possibly be some rare events on it, and he said that I could borrow it to see if there was anything that I could use for a video. Upon opening the save file, the main menu showed a section for Mystery Gift. While you could enable this at any point, the process to it isn't through normal gameplay, and you really don't do it without a reason. The save was left off in Rustboro City with only two badges to my name, and while normally this is something that'd be easy to write off and most people will just reset over, this one was a different story. As I scrolled through the PC, there was once again nothing to write home about, but then I made my way to the bag. Partway down the key item list was a certain item, the old sea map. This item was an in-game event that allows you to visit a location called Faraway Island, which allows you to encounter and catch Mew. Across the entire history of Pokemon events, this specific one is seen as the holy grail of events, and this Japanese YouTuber's reaction to finding this event on a random cartridge pretty much says it all. <laughs> While there was an event for Deoxys in the Hoenn games from many parts of the world, this specific event for some reason just never left Japan, with a small exception of an event that took place in theaters in Taiwan for buying a ticket for the movie Lucario and the Mystery of Mew. While Mew was eventually released at Toys R Us in the US to tie in with the same movie, the Mew was simply traded to your game off a copy of Fire Red, completely removing the need for the entire event. The history around Gen 3 Mew outside Japan is truly strange, as this specific event lasted for only three hours on September 30th of 2006. Well, personally, I've gone as a kid to Toys R Us events like this in the past for things like Manaphy and Darkrai in the same time window, those events were eventually released again to everyone which begs the question as to why they wanted to make this Pokemon so unbelievably hard to get. After looking through the game, there was no trace of Mew in the boxes or in the Pokedex, which left me with the biggest question. Is this event real? It's important to note that real and legitimate are actually two different terms in this scenario. Back during the days of GameShark and action replay hacking, it was extremely easy to input cheat codes that just gave you all the event items. While to my knowledge that was totally possible in the Gen 4 games, Emerald was a little bit different. In order to use the old C-Map event, there was a flag that has to be set off in order for it to activate meaning that if you just cheat the item in and then try to go to the dock, the game won't acknowledge it and nothing will happen. The workaround was to just teleport your character to Faraway Island instead, which obviously worked fine, but that meant that I need to play this copy all the way until that point. This event only occurs in Lulikov City, so I started making the trek to the later half of the story. During this process, I started to take note of a lot of small things that convinced me that maybe this cartridge is legitimate. The most obvious one was that this is the only event on the save file. In my head, realistically, if you're gonna cheat an event into the game, why not just cheat all of them. The Deoxys event, the Eon ticket, and the Lugia and Ho-Oh event at Naval Rock are still unbelievably rare to find untouched, so it just makes sense to put all of them in. Additionally, this game had two of the Hoenn starter Pokemon. Now normally this would be a pretty big red flag, but this Mudkip was traded from another copy of Emerald, presumably to counter the fact that they chose Trico and needed something to take down Torchic. Is this kind of sad? Yeah, half the Hoenn Pokedex are water types, but to me this screams second playthrough. Obviously this is a huge stretch, but it just seems like this wasn't their main copy of the game, so they could have just redeem this event multiple times when it was available. After struggling to comprehend really any dialogue that was going on for about six hours, I finally made it to Lily Cove, and upon talking to the attendant, I was taken to Faraway Island. Upon making my way through the trees, I entered a small enclosure, and then... Now, while this is all great, there was still one thing I wanted to figure out. I mentioned before that I wanted to find out if this event was legitimate. Nowadays, the distribution cards for all the Gen 3 events have essentially been recreated or found and extracted to be put online for preservation purposes, which means that if you injected the event into your own copy, it would be pretty much impossible to tell the difference from the one that I have. Originally, I chalked it up to being legit because I obtained the game long before any of the events were recreated, but after asking online, apparently that's been a thing long before 2016, but I do have a few more ideas that might help. 
Back to the game shark, if you end up using the code for the item, you apparently unlock every gold symbol in the battle frontier, and this save was completely empty, and that could be because of the fact that the game didn't have the frontier pass at the time, but it's definitely something to consider. Another thing to note is what print run the cartridge was made. Each copy of Pokemon Emerald is embossed with a number, and if the number is under 30, then this specific cartridge was available in stores for purchase before the release of the event. Mine has double zeros, so I can only assume this cart was the first wave of copies that was ever sent out. The final big thing is something at the time that I didn't have the ability to check. By inserting a wireless adapter into the Game Boy Advance and selecting a mystery gift, you can check the contents of what had been redeemed, and to no surprise, the event was there. Because the Game Boy Advance didn't have an internal clock, there was no way to check the date of when the event was received, and nowadays this is how you reproduce the event on actual cartridges. But collectively with everything that I've explained, the chances of this being real is much more than fake in my opinion. Because of this, I really didn't know what to do with it. Obviously hunting a shiny Mew and Emerald is a cool idea, but this is maybe one of a handful of the untouched Pokemon cartridges that are still in circulation, so I just held on to it for years until I started my Emerald Living decks. See, the original plan for that video was to end with Mew. I complete the entire challenge and finish by catching a Pokemon that is otherwise impossible to get, but it just felt like a waste. I went back and forth over it, and eventually I decided that if I was going to do something with this cartridge, it was going to be a shiny hunt. Aside from the limited time research in Pokemon Go, shiny Mew has only been legitimately obtainable in the Japanese copies of Emerald, and possibly a few English copies due to the fact that there was never a Taiwanese or Chinese Emerald, as those were the only two languages sold in the country at that time. With the opportunity in front of me, I began the coolest shiny hunt that I've ever done. So let's go over the process. Upon entering the area, Mew will disappear into the tall grass, and by walking around, it will pop its tail into the air, showing you the direction it's going. When you get into contact with it, you can interact to start the battle. Now to a lot of you, this seems like a clean cut hunt, but unfortunately, there's a lot more to it than it seems. While it looks like I can just save in front of Mew and then soft reset, that isn't possible for this game. In the Pokemon games, when you boot up your game, the game will begin generating a random number every frame or once every 60 seconds. This number essentially determines things like its nature, stats, and most importantly, whether it's shiny or not. Because the game can't actually constantly randomly generate numbers, the game essentially has a pre-made list, and instead will boot with a seed or a random location on this list. That way, when you play, it seems like it's always random. The issue with Pokemon Emerald is that for some reason, it was changed to boot with the same starting value every single time, meaning that if you play the game the exact same, you get the same results. An easy way to show this is with Spinda. Out of the 4 billion patterns of Spinda, it's basically impossible to get the same one, but by saving in front of the grass and rebooting your game, you can routinely find the exact same pattern with the same nature and stats. Because of this, unless my first few frames of the game are shiny, Mew will essentially never be shiny on this save file, which means that I'm going to have to encounter it the intended way. While it seems annoying that you have to search the grass constantly to find it, Mew actually follows a set path based on how you move, so by being a little precise, you can guarantee an encounter very quickly. For some reason, if you run away from battle, Mew will disappear and then reappear when you enter the area again, which to my knowledge is only also possible with Rayquaza in this game. But this essentially makes it just about as fast as a soft reset hunt would normally be. With this, you can get about 100 encounters per hour, and when the odds are 1 in 8192, it's expected to take a bit. On the 23rd of February, I began hunting it down, and during the process, I learned a few things. As you'd expect, I messed up following the path quite a bit, which led me to chasing it around for a few minutes. But I found out that if you encounter it in the open patches, you'll get a completely different encounter background, which to my knowledge is exclusively for this battle. I found out later there's a different path that you can do to guarantee this type of encounter, but in my opinion, it was a lot harder to perfect. Now, it's important to note that I was relatively prepared for the moment when I finally found Mew, but I realized that realistically, I should be a bit more secure than having a Sceptile with False Swipe, which by this point, I didn't even know what slot it was in, so I decided that I probably needed a Sleep User. Originally, I caught a Shroomish so I could eventually teach it Spore, but considering that I would needed to grind a level 54 in the slowest experience group, I figured there were better options. I decided to tap into my living decks and use a Parasect, and as a bonus, due to character limitations, I unlocked its secret name. Paris. At the end of the first day, I finished with 600 encounters, but I knew the next day I was going to try and make a huge dent. The following day, I spent basically the entire day grinding this out, and thankfully, I was finally able to get the blue guy. Oh, finally, dude. This took so long. Okay, so not the blue guy, but with a little rename, you can barely tell the difference. On day four, I managed to reach well past 2,000 encounters, and I once again had a bad realization. This thing is really easy to fail. Because this Mew has access to Metronome, it can pull a random move from the hundreds of Gen 3 moves, which includes things like Roar, Whirlwind, or my personal favorite, 
While I can't necessarily avoid every option to fail this with one Pokemon, removing the most moves would be ideal. I ended up going to the Safari Zone to catch a Psyduck that had the ability Damp, which removes the chances of using Explosion or Self-Destruct. After adding it to my party, I was fully prepared for as much of this hunt as I could possibly be, and I spent the next few days grinding out as much as I could. <gasps> yes! Oh my god! Oh my god, there it is! Oh my god! I wasn't even paying attention! Oh my god, there it is! I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say! Oh my god, this is something I have been holding on to for like seven years? Despite this, I can still fail it, but I think I have a somewhat foolproof plan. I'm just gonna try and throw a ball. I wanna catch this in a dive ball so badly. Just transform, transform, transform. Yes! Wait, what? Oh, I didn't even know that it transforms into the shiny. Oh, I had so many other options for that. Okay, well, we can, we can test that out in a bit. This means that its catch rate should be really, really high. Oh yeah, right. I have Parasect. Um, oh, which move is Spore? Okay, hold on, hold on, I need to, I need to look this up. Okay, the, the options that come up are not helpful. Okay, so the options I'm getting are Mushroom, Brisket, I, I mean, Flash is correct, but br Brisket? <laughs> what is Brisket? Okay, that doesn't really help me. Maybe I can check by PowerPoints? Okay, so this has to be Spore, okay. Come on. Yes, dude. <laughs> oh my god. I can't believe it. I cannot believe that I got this Pokemon. I'm not gonna name it. I'm not one to nickname Pokemon. I really never have been. I only kind of do it when I do Nuzlocke. So we're not gonna nickname this thing. And when you look at it, the grand scheme of things, I mean, at it when it's it's one in 8,192 odds, that's not that bad. It's not awful. It did take a while, regardless. All right, let's just show this off in battle. See if I can do a transform. Oh my God. I'm actually gonna lose it. Uh, I think that this is probably transform. And it turns into the shinies. That's so sick. That's such a sick. Oh my god. Oh, that's so sick. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> oh, that's such a neat little thing. Wow. It's a shame that that's not in the newer games because it that just has so much utility. Now, honestly, I I don't think that this Pokemon, this Pokemon will definitely leave this copy of the game, but I don't think it's ever going to leave Gen 3. But there's just something about like having this kind of tangible, I guess, in a way, in this game. It just has so much value, man, to me personally. I think it's kind of goofy to put value on shinies, but this one is just, it's a little bit of a different story. And, um... I have it. In total, this entire challenge took about 40 hours to complete, and considering that I found it at about half odds, I'm definitely not complaining. Maybe one day I'll try and hunt down the elusive Deoxys for a video, but I think that's going to do it for Pokemon Emerald for a bit. Thanks for checking out the video, and I'll see you on the next one.